Hi, good morning. I'm Rohit, and uh, con we're continuing with our series, Soulful Contemplations. Today I'm going to be reading to you from a book that I love, dear, I love dearly. The book's called Anamkara, and it's by John O'Donohue. Anamkara by John O'Donohue. Um, love for you to read it as well sometime. Um, but for now, I'm going to get into the, the book, and let's start with this. Okay, we're back. And um, I think the John, John O'Donohue is from Ireland and from the Celtic background. So you have some very different insights than you would find, and yet very universal insights that you would find also in other authors who are deeply spiritual, like Rumi, who is a Sufi. So I'll be reading by, from different authors like this who, who touch the, the spirit of the divine in their writings, in very poetic ways, in very beautiful prose, in ways that really awaken and inspire spirit, in, in wake, awaken and inspire our hearts uh, to reach for something more beautiful and more grand in our lives. And I think it, it, we don't do this every Monday to Friday, so I think it'd be great if you can join me. All right, so here's Anamkara, A-N-A-M-C-A-R-A, -A -A, Anamkara. John O'Donohue writes here, he says, We are always on a journey from darkness into light. At first, we are children of the darkness. Your body and your face were formed first in the kind darkness of your mother's womb. Your birth was a first journey from darkness into light. See, the idea is to contemplate these words, to think about them to let them sink deeply within your consciousness. And that's why we attempt to read slowly and digest it, not just rush through. It's not about acquiring information. It's not about trying to become smart or intelligent, but rather it's about trying to really deeply feel and absorb the deeper meaning of these words. So your birth was a first journey from darkness into light. In fact, if you look at it, this entire world is actually dark. I don't know if you know that. Um, the sun exists with giving out light. But even on its journey from the sun till our earth or the moon or any other planet, you do not see the sun rays. You only see the sun out there beaming light, and then when it hits an object like the moon, the moon lights up. It hits the earth, the earth lights up. But the other side of the moon or the other side of the earth still remains dark. Now, it's a very interesting thing to notice. The journey that it's making, it's still dark. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. But on the earth, it's different. When the sun rays come, sunlight comes through the earth, we observe it as sun rays. We can see it coming, streaming through. And that's because of dust, fine, very fine dust particles in the atmosphere. Those light up. It's like magical little pieces of light lighting up, giving us the illusion of sun rays. Anyways, coming back to Don, John O'Donohue. Your birth was a first journey from darkness into light. All your life, your mind lives within the darkness of your body, right? Your mind lives within the darkness of your body. Every thought that you have is a flint moment, a spark of light from your inner darkness. The miracle of thought is its presence in the night side of your soul. The brilliance of thought is born in darkness. Every day is a journey. We come out of the night into the day. All creativity awakens at this primal threshold where light and darkness rest and bless each other. The threshold where light and darkness test and bless each other. What is that moment? That moment where the sun rises, dawn, 
right? You discover balance in your life when you learn to trust the flow of this ancient rhythm. The year also is a journey with the same rhythm. The Celtic people had a deep sense of the circular nature of our journey. We come out of darkness of winter into the possibility and effervescence of springtime. Ultimately, light is the mother of life. Where there is no light, there can be no life. If the angle of the sun were to turn away from the earth, all human, animal, and vegetative life as we know it would disappear. Ice would freeze the earth again. Light is the secret presence of the divine. It keeps life awake. Life, light is a nurturing presence which calls forth warmth and color in nature. The soul awakens and lives in light. It helps us to glimpse the sacred depths within us. Once human beings begin to search for a meaning to life, light becomes one of the most powerful metaphors to express the eternity and depth of life. In the Western tradition, and indeed in the Celtic tradition, thought has often been compared to light. In its luminosity, the intellect was deemed to be the place of the divine within us. I'm going to talk about this, so we can again go further into this. But let me read a little bit more from John O'Donohue, and then we'll come into a little discussion about it. When the human mind begins to consider the next greatest mystery of life, the mystery of love, light also always used as a metaphor. Light was also used as a metaphor for its power and presence. When love awakens in your life, in the night of your heart, it is like the dawn breaking within you. Where before there was anonymity, now there is intimacy. Where before there was fear, now there is courage. Where before in your life there was awkwardness, now there is a rhythm of grace and gracefulness. Where before you used to be jagged, now you are elegant and in rhythm with yourself. When love awakens in your life, it is like a rebirth, a new beginning. So, what is this? Why is he? What is he talking about? When, if this is the case, no wonder we long for love all the time. No wonder we feel that only when we are in love are we complete. But there is a struggle between light and darkness, between love and the ego, love and the mind. That struggle is this, that just as the sunrise and the dark night struggle in those moments of dawn, there is a struggle between our mind and love. When we fall in love, our mind is very starts to become attached to the person that we've fallen in love with. It starts to want to own this person and claim them as mine, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my beloved, my the love of my life. And it's all linked up to my, 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 my. That which you call mine becomes the cause of attachment. That which is the cause of attachment becomes the cause of fear. And that which is the cause of fear we will now attempt to control. We will place expectations on that. We will place needs on that. We will place our fears on that. Because once you are attached to something, then you need it, you expect it, and you fear losing it, whether that is an object or whether that is a person. So what is the way out? Is the way out to not be in love? Is the way out to um, never experience uh, pain and suffering of loss? Where is the answer? I see many people looking for love, including myself, and struggling to find it and struggling to hold it and struggling to be with it. Fearing losing it when you do find it and fearing never finding it when you don't have it in your life. Our journey through love is often a journey through fear. Think about it. 
Our journey through love is often a journey through fear. Fear in the beginning of not getting love. Fear, when you do have it, of losing it. And fear, if it should end, or if the person should leave, or if they should die, that we'll never find it again. So in all of the stages of our love, there is fear. And maybe that's what makes it so painful. But what if there was no fear? What if you were fearless? What if you understood that love is not a scarce commodity that is hard to find, that can be easily taken away from you, and once it's gone, you're finished, devastated? Right? You have no recourse except some vague magic that might happen and it'll show up again in your life. So, um, I ask you to contemplate these things, not because uh, there's not, well, there really isn't much better to do, honestly. <laughs> it's the same as the search for light, the search for the divine, the search for God. There is no end to that. Just as there is no end to the search for love, there is no end to the search for the divine, for light, for God. In fact, everything we do, everything we do, when we are trying to get possessions, when we want a nice car, a nice house, when we want love, when we want happiness, when we want anything, it is a search for the divine. I, I might be overstepping to say this and might be oversimplifying, but let me, let's me let see if there's any truth to that. Um, we look for, let's say we want this new, we want to buy a house, or we want to get a new car, or we want to get some new clothes, or we want to get something, you know, uh, and some new technology, whatever your fascination is, whatever your uh, obsession is, whatever your toy is, right? Why do you get want it? Ultimately, it's the feeling that if I have this, my life will become easier. I will feel better. Ultimately, I will feel good. So ultimately, we're chasing feeling good. Feeling good is about happiness. Right? I want to feel good. Why? Because there's a certain... So happiness is not just the elation of, you know, some grand thing happening, but happiness is also the little things. Ultimately, we're chasing happiness. We chase love. Not so that somebody could leave us and hurt us, not so that someone could beat us and, and mistreat us, but because we want happiness, even in love. We want to live happily ever after, as the fairy tale goes. So ultimately, we're chasing happiness in everything. Right? We don't do a job because we want to be miserable. We do a job because we feel it's going to fulfill us, it's going to take care of our needs, and because it's something that will satisfy us. We'll ultimately feel good. That is the expectation. And if that expectation is not met, then we want to go somewhere else. Right? So ultimately we chase happiness. Where can happiness be found that does not waver? Where can it be found? John O'Donohue here says, it can be found in the light. Light is the mother of life. Where there is no light, there can be no life. What is this light? Is it just about the sunlight? On level, yes. At a physical level, yes. At a physical level, he calls, says, light is a nurturing presence that calls forth warmth and color in nature. Then he says, the soul awakens and lives in light. Hmm. Ponder that. The soul awakens and lives in light. The soul, that which you are, your real essence, the real you, not the one that you think is you, not the mind, not the body, not your story, not your beliefs, not your ideas, but the real you, which is behind all of that, because you have a body, you have a story, you have a life. But you, that was always there when you were a baby, 
when you the you same you that was there when you were a teenager the same you that was there now and the same you that'll be there when you're old that you has been referred to as the soul the soul he says awakens and lives in light so it awakens in light in the presence of light the reason i'm doing this series here soulful contemplations is to share with you the light and wisdom of these wonderful writers because in hearing these words there is an awakening of the soul that happens and when that soul awakens you feel it as a sense of peace as a sense of bliss as a sense of happiness there's something inside you that stirs that feels that everything's okay, that life is okay, no matter how bad things have been, no matter how good things have been, right? That somehow it's all okay. And somehow we're going to make it through. I know we all live in difficult times right now, but this is, our, is, is, the, is the solace to find the light within ourselves, to find that spark of light that lives within all of us, to find it in ourselves, to find it in each other. He says the soul awakens and lives in light. So where that, that presence of light is found, whether it's in a writing like this, or it's in nature, or it's in another being, wherever you find that spark of light, those two sparks coming together, yours and theirs, yours and that of nature, yours and that of this writing, there is an Awakening, the soul awakens. And, hey, this is my people. This is my stuff. This is what I like. You've been chasing all your other stuff down the rabbit hole of life, trying to get this and do that and busyness and all of that. You'll never find your soul waking up in that in those moments. But when you hear something like this, when when it touches your heart and soul, ah, the soul awakens. The soul awakens, and it is those moments that are the most precious in life. So I invite you to join me every day as we explore these ideas. As we, as John O'Donohue says, as we glimpse the sacred depths within us. That is the intention of this soulful contemplations. And it is my honor and privilege to be able to serve you in this, through this process of reading and contemplating and opening your mind to the idea that there is a wisdom within you, a greater wisdom than all the intellect, than all the thinking, than all the feeling, than all the stuff of our lives. There is a greater wisdom within us. Dive within, feel it, experience it, and share your insights with me in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Have a wonderful and blessed day. I'll see you again every weekday around 9.30. Take care. Lots of love.